So thanks everyone. Uh, this is going to be attacking and defending JWT tokens, the ultimate guy. Uh, before we start, I'd like to, to shortly uh, thank the Linux Foundation and all of you for attending such a great event. So first of all, if you don't know me, so who am I? Uh, I am Leo Joskovic. I'll try to pronounce my name. And I'm coming uh, from Mexico originally. I'm a security researcher uh, in Palo Alto Network. Usually we do all, a lot of fun by hunting for web vulnerabilities. And uh, obviously we also try to improve our products as well. Uh, I'm a student also for MSE Cybersecurity on the, uh, the University of London. But I also so have some hobbies as well. I like football, soccer, Argentina, not Mexico, that time. I also like uh, baseball. And sushi, of course, not because I'm in Japan. I promise you, I like it everywhere. And of course, I like chili. I like a lot of spicy. So if you see me around putting some spicy on my soup, don't worry. I'm coming from Mexico, so this is who I am. Uh, today we have a very special agenda here. We're going to start with a brief history of how we used to, uh, we used to do the authentication and authorization. Uh, just a brief so that we can move forward to JWT or JOT fundamentals. Uh, we're going to see the advantages of JOT as well as some terminology because uh, at first it looked very confusing. There's a lot of terms there and they're all almost very similar to each other. Then we're going to move to some statistics, you know, because it's, it's good to, to have some idea of what's going on in, the, in every industry. And we're going to move on to a real exploitation scenario. We're going to see more attack vectors because there's many, many vectors out there. And of course, how we can protect ourselves from those uh, attacks, how we can mitigate those as well. So let's start with our brief history here. We know that HTTP, the protocol that runs uh, the web, is a stateless protocol. Uh, it means every time you authenticate, you, so you send a request, a special request to a server, so you need to uh, actually provide, again, a cookie uh, or some other uh, other form of authentication, just like every time you go to uh, you go into any office, you need to take your badge and put it again. And it doesn't matter how many times you were there. Even after 15 years, the CEO, everyone needs to take again the badge on that entry system and put it again and again for every uh, every time you go in. So the same applies for HTTP. Now, uh, regarding session session management and access control, so it used to be something similar with HTTP by using cookies. But we refer to authentication. So we used to use some session cookies depending on the technology. We had uh, you know, PHP, we had J uh, Java, Session ID, ASP, yeah, Cloud Fusion, all different kind of uh, technologies. And over there we used to send the cookie, uh, the session cookie for authenticating against a web server. The same goes for the authorization. The authorization, the authorization what used to be done only on the server side. It means if you're an administrator or if you have the right uh, permissions to access certain resource. So we used to do that only on the server side. Everything was just there and only there. Uh, this also has some other disadvantages because it means that every time we need to have a special database, some long file with all these records, with all these uh, sessions. And every time the user goes and tries to authenticate against that server, so it needs to go and look up for where that record is, where the session ID and if it even exists, and then move on uh, from there. But obviously, that's a little bit slower than just uh, using other technologies. And of course, we know that cookies, I mean, unless you use the right flags, which are a few ones, uh, they are vulnerable to XSS attacks, which is a very common attack that probably you are all aware of. So with cookies nowadays, this is what we see in almost every server, you know, just that's what they want. They want to kind of keep track of the user for advertising purposes. This is the main use of cookies nowadays. So let's move on to some JOT fundamentals. And you probably say, hey, why do you say JOT? So by design, JOT stands for J, uh, JSON Web Tokens, okay? That's RFC 7519, just in case somebody wants to know the, the number. And in the RFC itself, it says that you should pronounce that as JOT. I have no idea how they come up with such a name, but it's by design. And it's a standard for exchanging data between applications, okay, any kind of applications. And uh, optionally, we need to emphasize that, 
they are cryptographic this time, okay? We will see later why I must reinforce this specific topic about uh, optionally crypt uh, cryptographic this time. And where do we see those uh, jobs uh, being used? So we can see those in containerized web applications, any sort, uh, microservices, traditional APIs, you know, anywhere, any e-commerce, any sh online shop that you visit, they probably make some use of API. Mobile applications, uh, container registry, if you have some sort of uh, containers and you want to push or pull any image to that uh, repository, so you do that, the authorization also by uh, using JOTS as well. But mostly something that it's maybe not so uh, common is vaccination for uh, vaccination certificates for COVID, they also use some sort of JOTS, okay? And as you can see here, I mean, it comes in a format of like a QR code, but at the end, if you scan it, so you will see that usually, I mean, depending on the country, but uh, usually you will see kind of a JSON uh, web token there, and you will see almost the same format as with any other web application. And that's important because you will see later on how you can fake and you can make, uh, take advantage of uh, vulnerabilities to create your own uh, vaccination certificate. So just to summarize here uh, and also compare this, we have the evolution from standard cookies and we move on to JOTS. So first of all, we mentioned that tokens are stored on the server. And by JOTS, they're not. And that's an advantage because you don't need to keep up, uh, you don't need to keep trace of every single token where it is stored and, 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 and you need to store it in that specific server. And that leads us to easily scale, scale up. When you want to grow up, you have uh, 10 instances, you have uh, 10 containers, you want to make thousands of, or even hundreds of replications. So you don't need to save that specific token and, and move it over this uh, huge amount of uh, resources. You just save it on the client side. You save, I mean, on the same place where you save your, uh, your secrets, and then you pull up the secrets and then you can authenticate and authorize the user in hundreds or even thousands of different uh, services. Uh, another advantage here is that we can include more data. It's not just your authentication token and that's all. By using JOTS, you can include the date where this token has been generated. For you know statistics or login purposes, you can add roles, you can add uh, the email, the name, you can have a lot of data because at the end this is the purpose of JOTS, exchanging some data between applications. And all this, of course, you can encrypt. And the same goes for, for cookies. It's not strict by, uh, by itself, but you can also encrypt uh, the cookies by, by using some basic algorithm. Uh, but uh, here in JOTS, it comes very, very handy when you want to exchange data, sometimes sensitive data, and let's say you're a bank and you want to encrypt that data because you don't want the user, I mean, you mentioned that the token is stored on the client side. So if you encrypt that data, you can move on to and transfer it from servers uh, more uh, securely. And that was just like a brief of uh, JOTS fundamentals, but now, such as Mr. Miyamoto says, let's talk more about JOTS. So we have uh, some main components of how this is constructed, how or what consists of a JOTS or JWT token. So we have, first of all, the header. Um, the header is, I mean, just to simplify this, we can see that uh, you can define the uh, validation algorithm. So just to keep this simple, so I chose to use the HMAX with SHA-256. Okay, we'll see later a few, uh, there's a few differences between uh, this and the, the rest. So this is all that we, uh, we can use uh, by the header. And then the payload is actually the means, is actually what we want to, to see, or we want to, I mean, as an attacker, we want to manipulate or as a, you know, the developer or the defender, this is what we really want to protect. So here, uh, just by an example, I gave it a name of Haruki Tanaka. It should add, this is just a claim, it's kind of an attribute. Again, we mentioned that there are like just a few claims, a few attributes that you can add more to your, uh, to your token. You can add, a, you know, there's a full, full list of, of reserve or even uh, custom claims or attributes that you can add. So this is just a very simplified version here. EXP for expiration this is the way of, one of the ways of revoking tokens. Once the expiration is, uh, the time has been passed, so 
you can for sure uh, validate and, uh, and make sure actually that the token is not valid anymore. And of course, we can also the role if, you know, for authorization purposes, if this user is, a, is an operator, is an administrator, support, editor, you know, depending on the type of application that we're talking about. So we can add the role as well. And why not? We can add also the email. Don't try to email that. Uh, I'm sure that this doesn't exist. I just made it up. So there's no Hiroki Tanaka on this till now. Uh, that works for the Linux Foundation. And lastly, we have the last component. So the third component is the signature. The signature is the cryptographic string that we use to validate both the header and the payload. And it just looks like, you know, some random number, long, long string that we usually don't really understand what it, it means. But let's try to keep this on the side for a moment and then we'll come back to it later. So the format for JOTS is, I mean, again, excluding the signature, is the header that we have right here at the top. Then we have a dot. And then we have the payload. Again, I just simplified this to use only two attributes. And the way of transmitting that and transferring this to the client and back to the server is by encoding this into base64. Now we need to bear in mind here, this is not a common base64 that we know. It's called base64 URL. There are some nuances there, such as, you know, because we're talking about URLs, so uh, such uh, like the, the plus, the minus signs, they're a little bit different than the common base64. And uh, this is how it looks like. You can see here on the right, this is basically, again, just the encoded version of a very simple uh, JOT token here. Now, how the generation flow works? Like, okay, we talk about the three main components, how the basic format is, but how actually it's being generated. So first of all, we have a user that logs in. Uh, of course, you know, that's not a strong password, so don't try that. And um, af after, of course, the user is successfully authenticated, so then the server actually generates a token, okay? So this is just a ver the version that we saw earlier. We have the algorithm here, which is HSHMAC uh, SHA-256, and the name, and role and email, of course, that's pulled up from uh, an internal database that is not exposed to any user. And then the server also encodes this to the base64 URL version. But then what happens here is the server signs this token. The server makes sure that, okay, hey, this is a stamp and this is what I'm going to use in order to validate this token because if later on this token is being manipulated, so then the server will know and actually it, it can either refuse that or accept that for further processing. So this is the, uh, the resulting token here. Uh, we have at the top the header, we have in the middle here after a dot, you can see that the dot is not being encoded. And this is the payload and lastly we have the signature. And these three parts are being sent to the user. So as you can notice here, uh, the user is already authenticated after these few steps. So this is how the generation flow works usually. Of course, we can add more, you know, a very complex scenario here with more different endpoints and, and what, but this is just to simplify this flow. So we talk about this signature. Now, what is the signature exactly? Why do we need a signature? So the signature, just to remind ourselves, is what actually securely validates the token. If there is no signature, it just means, hey, just come in. Like, I trust you. Like, why not? So. It's being calculated by uh, taking the header and taking the payload, again, followed by a, I mean, a dot after the, the header and the payload, and then we convert that into base64. That resulting string is being taken to the next step, and with the key, again, the key in this case, because we're using HMAC, it's just a long password, it's a long password. So, of course, uh, you need to choose, like, you know, the, uh, from the, the, uh, the, the rules are, that you need to use a strong password, you know, A, 10, 12, you know, above this kind of um, characters if you're going for the manual part or you can use UUID or whatever the uh, mechanism you use to generate that really strong and long key. But on the other hand, you can use a private key, of course, with another algorithm. This is the PKI uh, system where you can use uh, private and public keys, but let's leave that for a minute. Now what happens is that after you sign the token, 
and after you have this part, you send that to the user. So if even one bit, just one little, just a word, even just one dot, something has changed into that token, right after the token is being sent to the server, oh, the server is going to say, hey, no, that's not my token because it's, it has been altered. This is not the same signature. And as you can uh, see, and it will be reflected by this puzzle, there is going to be a cons inconsistency because the server is going to say, hey, this is not the same. Not just by one bit, just like, you know, by ha a hashing function. Basically, in, in some cases, it could be a completely different signature. It could be something completely different, a uh, different color, different string. So the server is going to say, hey, this has been manipulated, so I'm not going to accept that. And that's why the signature is very important. So the whole flow, it works like this. So after the user is authenticated, let's say that the user wants to request or wants to access his or her own bank account, okay? Let's say the ID just for uh, this example, it's going to be one, and they want to view their account. They want to view the, their statements, they want to view whatever uh, deposits they have on their account. So they send the previously provided token here, they send it to the resource provided, okay? Just, it could be any API endpoint. And then this server, obviously sending it to a, an authentication server, so it's going to check for the signature. The way of checking for that is again by revalidating, regenerating, uh, I'm sorry, revalidating that uh, token by using the same key and the same algorithm, which is in this case, H1256. And that we compare to the provided signature that the user has give us. Because uh, we cannot just say, okay, we're gonna take the header and the payload and we're going to just try to sign this again because that's not gonna have any other difference, right? We need to retake it and compare it to what the user has provided us. And if all goes well, okay, if no argument, no parameter, no value was tampered there, so then the user will have an access granted there. Otherwise, nothing is gonna be there, okay? And uh, we will see later uh, why, uh, I mean specifically, we need to also validate not only the, the signature, but also other parts of the token as well, okay? Because we should never assume that the user is talking specifically about HMAC256 unless instructed by the token itself. But that was too much. Now, uh, that was about just some fundamentals, but what about the terminology? We probably have heard about some other terms, JWS, JWK, JWE, JWT, it's just too much. Probably the first time that you learn about these terms, you're like kind of overwhelmed, you don't even know where to move on from there, it's just too much. So for that, we have this simple uh, Venn diagram that tries to simplify this. I know it can be a little bit overwhelming at first, but trust me, after this explanation, it will be much easier. So first of all, we have JWT. So JWT is just, yeah, just the essential format. It's just basically saying uh, the JSON format, the way of actually originally transmitting data is by using JSON. That's mainly what the RFC, the specification 7519 is talking about. Then we have JWS. JWS adds more uh, the, the signature or the way of validating these tokens because otherwise, again, they're useless. We don't trust the user, we don't trust any uh, information provided to us. And then we have uh, JWE, which is a little, uh, just another extension of that. It's basically, it could be both, but basically it adds the, uh, the encryption layer, it adds that uh, the payload, it not, it's not just um, signed, but it's also encrypted. Because again, if we are a bank, probably we want to hide some data or some information about the user, maybe for some other uh, industries or some other organizations it's not required, but for some they do. And this are these two, the sig JWS signature and the encryption are actually defined in something called JWA. JWA is just like a, the way of saying, okay, you're going to encrypt, so which algorithms you're going to use? You're going to sign, you're going to validate, which algorithms are you going to use? So these are defined in JWA. Then we have another specification called JWK. And JWK is just uh, when you use public or in, in private uh, keys for 
uh, signing and validating your, um, your, your tokens. Uh, it basically is the structure of how these are being constructed as well as some public keys. So usually companies may, might have like four or five, 10 different public keys, you know, in case some key has expired, you need to revoke some key because it has been stolen for any reason, a uh, company may have more than one and this is where this is being defined. Now because of that, you might think, okay, now what I'm gonna do? I'm going to sign, I'm going to, you know, like just, we have a PS, HMAC, we have just a lot of algorithms, a lot of choices, okay? You go to the store, you have 300 different data chips. What are you going to choose? Okay, this is secure and this is all secure, but this is all secure, it, it just doesn't work. So for that, there's some other organization called uh, Jose, which they try to standardize everything here. They have like a framework and they say, hey, please make use of this. This is what we want to use. You could use some other more uh, uh, stronger uh, algorithms. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're free to do so, but just in case this is what the standard that we try to uh, make is what we want to do. So Jose basically collects and compiles all these algorithms and it tried to make some order here with all this. So just a little bit more if we dig deeper into this. So we said that JWA, the algorithms, these algorithms are defined right there. And what do we have there? So we have JWS, which is again for signing. And signing basically means integrity. We want to make sure that the token wasn't manipulated by any during the transmission from the client to the server. So we have some examples here of what kind of algorithms we can use. RS is RSA. They all use SHA with different uh, key lengths, 256, 384, 512. And we have also the elliptic curve, ES or PS. And basically the difference between them is again, if we use symmetric keys or asymmetric keys, if we use HMAX or HS, basically means that we are going to store a password, a long token, uh, UUID, whatever, on, uh, in our server. And by the rest, we're going to store our private key, okay? But pay attention here. By design, there's also an algorithm called known. I have no idea why they did that, but yeah, it's there by design. You can specify known. You're not going to use any algorithm to actually uh, verify that the token was uh, wasn't manipulated. It just basically means I trust everyone, okay? Open house. And on the other hand, we have JWE. Now here, uh, it's a little bit more complicated because we're getting into cryptography. Uh, we have just different, uh, a huge list of different um, algorithms that we can use, and that's for confidentiality, okay? Integrity for validating, confidentiality is for hiding data from the user or whoever is in the middle. And on the other hand, we have some sort of example here of what a JWK, the key store, looks like. We have the key type here. We defined the algorithm type EC for elliptic curve. So that's why we have X and Y. So there are just two coordinates, two values that we need to provide. And as well as the public key, the key ID that we use for that specific uh, token. Um, and basically, this is all about this uh, three or four actually different uh, specifications. A little bit more about JWK is where this is located, okay? It's a file, a JSON file, that in many cases, it's being stored under this location. It could be .will dash known slash jwks.json or under openid, auth, or simply on the root, jwks.json, or in other maybe not so common places, or just like slash API slash keys. Or if we're using a version, version one, two, three, depending on the version that we use, or simply something custom as jwk-set.json. Now this is important because we need to know where the token is leading to us. Uh, in some cases we could see some uh, more information that is being stored over there. And again, as an attacker, we want this kind of juice information here. But before we proceed, Let's see some statistics. Let's see something interesting here. So APIs became crucial here because they bring a lot of benefits, really a lot. Now, by uh, saying APIs, we imply also jobs. 
because APIs work usually with JWT, with JWT tokens. And we have here some classification by industry. Um, so we see that at least the financial sector, at least that this is what the state of APIs.com presents, we have at least 80%, 81% of the websites that use all APIs. It means almost everyone. And uh, by technology, yeah, interesting that it's a little bit less, but technology, manufacturing, I mean, besides government that, you know, are is on top of that. Uh, for some reason, they, you know, the uh, adaptability takes a little bit more time with government agencies, but still they also have a huge uh, use of APIs. And that's why it's very important because again, API implies also jobs. Now, let's talk about a real exploitation scenario. Okay, we talk about some uh, attacks, some history, what do we know, what can we do? So let's just say real exploitation scenario. If it's not now, so when is it going to be? Okay, now this is a real, uh, real attack that happened not a long time ago. Uh, this is in samocat.ru. Uh, it's just uh, you know, a provider of electric scooter in Russia. Yeah. And this is owned by mail.ru, the biggest provider, the biggest mail provider and ISP in Russia. So what happened here is that, uh, I mean, there was a, a key, actually the signing key was predictable. And you can understand by yourself what that means. So the user was already uh, authenticated against the server. You know, you can just sign up freely. And then the token was sent to the server, but after being manipulated, we can say, hey, the role is set to user or operator, and then we can manipulate and change that to admin. Okay, what's gonna happen? Because the key was predictable, so the token was actually valid. So when it reached, it reached the, the server here, so the token was actually validated by the server. And then when the user requested any endpoint, the admin panel, or any other privilege panel or privilege resource, so the access was granted. Basically, that leads to a full account takeover. You could impersonate any user. You could actually do any action on the server, because why not? I mean, if the server usually trusts your token, and your token is not being actually validated as it is, as it should, because you know the, the, the signing key is not such uh, as strong as it should be, so then that leads to a complete disaster. But let's see a little bit more about uh, some, my bad, about uh, the real or, or the technical data here. So we have the token here. Okay, again, this is just a simplified version. There's not much data about how exactly or what fields were included there. But let's assume that they had this admin set to false. Okay, it just basically means you're not an admin. Okay. So by using this short script in Python, you can already sign that and change the admin to true, okay? Then the key here, that was the default key that they used, okay? It was predictive, it just, they just used secret. Nothing really fancy, right? So the token was uh, signed and then the token was sent to some vulnerable endpoint, okay? Just imagine the admin panel. So the token was validated and accepted by the server. Then the server here actually uh, granted access to the user. Yeah, you are whoever you are, you are an administrator, okay? Two minutes before, you didn't have access to that. You got 401 or whatever the other uh, HTTP error that you get. You have access denied. But after that, you can actually see everything. You're an administrator. You don't even work in Russia. You don't even work for mail.ru, but you could just do that because of this little uh, role here and the problem about the key, okay? So uh, you might think that this is not like a real, or you know, it sounds maybe like a very stupid thing to do, but trust me, we'll see shortly a lot of more examples that they also do something uh, similar to that. Now, uh, besides that, okay, we saw just one thing about a predictable uh, password. Uh, predictable signing key. But there are other many attack vectors here. So we have on one hand, we have the header here, and we have something called with a mismatch. There has been, again, I just took one example, one CD of each because there has been many of that, I mean, of each here. Uh, one of them is algorithm confusion where you basically put, instead of HMAC, you put RSA, 
and the, basically the server it accepts both so you just get confused by that and you can sign your to your token with that or the use of none yeah if you use none the server accepts that you just don't need any any key any any key and any signature it basically means yeah just bypass the uh, validation there other cases are uh, discrepancy between algorithm and signature like okay because if you're using let's say HMAC with 256 and then you have you know like a huge uh, signature there then it doesn't really make sense I mean it's 256 bits but you send something like 4,000 bits which doesn't really make sense or on the other hand we have also uh, injections all kind of injections XSS injection SQL injection uh, remote command injection uh, anything any kind of injection that we can think about code injection or even path reversal if we talk about the key ID parameter here we have other uh, vectors here JQU or X5U or X5C which are claims or other attributes that we can use to verify or uh, actually to uh, lead the user to verify the token by using a URL or by using a certificate located on an external endpoint so that could lead to a uh, SSRF or an open redirect and that again that happens through Invicti so again there are many cases uh, we have cases here for many of these vulnerabilities just like this one there's a website it's really funny about it's called how many days since a jot algo known vulnerable.com and it basically keeps track of uh, this kind of vulnerability so it happened uh, just 298 days ago maybe a little bit more uh, with the Brazilian government they wanted to verify the COVID certificate and you can see here that people this guy here the hacker it was able to uh, create a fake COVID certificate of the president himself okay and the same thing happened in UK and in more countries as well so let's just go back to some more attack vectors here we have also on the payload we have uh, other CVEs we have this realization attacks if you use the CTI the content type and you manipulate that to use Java visualization mind type uh, you could use JTI for um, uh, basically the absence of JTI for avoiding replay attacks so that happens in uh, common library job.net uh, simply claims were they were not validated okay any any of these claims any of these attributes the value was not validated they just trusted the, uh, the user or in some other cases with the signature here just uh, what happened now with uh, made the review or uh, uh, this uh, company here that the key was predictable they didn't use a really strong key or other cases which is something more complicated is where yeah they were actually signing in uh, cryptographically signed the token but there was an issue with that with mathematics so they could just input some random value and that could turn into a valid signature there so how do we protect ourselves from that how can actually uh, mitigate all these attack vectors so obviously the first thing to do is to keep updated all these open source third-party libraries whatever you use PyJWP, JSON web token whatever you use it should be updated and always don't trust the user you need to sanitize and validate all when I say all it means the algorithm it means every single attribute every single claim and value okay you never ever trust your users uh, more often when it with time-based claims yeah because they can be also manipulated not before you should have there's like uh, three different of those uh, time step uh, claims also you need to keep a whitelist of URLs to verify against those key source okay because you don't want your user to provide 10.1.0.1 which is for your admin uh, internal endpoint right and also it is arguable about you should send your jot in your authorization header otherwise it will be in the local storage or system storage and that's not really recommended and of course do not include any sensitive data no passwords nothing else just whatever you need and lastly you need to properly revoke tokens what happens if for some reason the token uh, you know somebody stole the token some met in the middle so you need to have also ways of mitigating that as well uh, of course use strong keys but not only that use safe and secure places to store those in a key management system usually in the cloud and of course log and monitor because you need to know where you know you keep on 
uh, receiving the same request with some, um, uh, you have a pattern there with where you receive the same token with just slightly different values, you need to know that you are under an attack. And basically, that was all. And thank you for joining and listening. Any questions? Cool in Japanese as well. Um, yes. I'll repeat my question. So you mentioned the example of encrypting JWT tokens. So I'm curious if we are talking about a web client in which the storage is accessible by the users, uh, is there a scenario where they also use encrypted JWT tokens and how does it benefit them? Um, okay, that's a good question. Uh, basically, we're, when you send the decoded, uh, the encoded uh, tokens to the user, just, you know, you put it into the terminal, you do pi base 64 minus D, and it just decoded that. And it's just like, it's in another format, but it's, it's uh, visualable, uh, visualizable by anyone. So if you apply cryptography to that, so then the payload, second part, it's going to be like just uh, uh, some random symbols there. It's gonna look like binary. Even after decoding that, you're not gonna be able to decrypt, I mean, unless you know the key, but uh, usually you're not going to be able to see what's inside. So that's the, the encryption or JWE that adds to the JWT. Okay, so in that scenario, the encryption key would still be available to the client so that they will be able to decrypt this decoded JWT. Um, is that's that a, a correct assumption? That's a good question, uh, but no. No, okay. actually because everything happens on the server and that just being sent okay. to the client. Okay. So there, there might, I mean, actually the key, you're right. The key is there, the public key is there, but it's also encrypted. Right. So there's not really a way of uh, decrypting that uh, unless you have the key. Okay, cool. Or in this case, the private key. Got it, thank you. Okay, welcome. Okay, any more questions? Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>